Welcome to our Poundcast listeners. Today, um, I'm very excited to be talking to Rita Martins, who is the author of Web3 in Financial Services, a book that will be published in the UK on the 3rd of June. And we're talking about this, we're recording this in advance of the book being published, but of course, uh, by the time you listen, it will probably have been out for a few weeks. Um, so welcome, uh, Rita. It's great to have you on the Poundcast today, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Thank you. Yeah, delighted to be here today. Um, so let's start off with a little bit about you. Uh, what's your background? What was your journey to Web3 and financial services? Yeah, so I started my career within the consulting um, area. So I work for Anastin Yang and Accenture, but always working with financial services. And probably because of that starting of my career, I was always keen on learning about technologies. And I was always keen to learn about new innovation within financial services. So when I was at Accenture, probably around 2017, as I was learning about new technologies and working with the finance team, which you probably know, it's very heavily um, on reconciliation. They have big teams trying to do reconciliation of data, trying to do additional visualization dashboards to try and tell the story of what the data is, is, is saying. And at this time, I heard of this digital ledger, a ledger that would allow to reduce or even really eliminate some of these reconciliations activities. And so I thought, well, this is perfect. I mean, this will be a game changing for finance. At the time, it was probably too early for the technology and it was probably too early for even uh, consulting and even experts in finance because we were still looking into RPA, into robotics. Um, and so it was really too early to have this conversation, but I kept looking into it from a personal perspective. And as you know, blockchain ecosystem has evolved into much more nowadays. And then I left and I work at HSBC and HSBC I was doing this global role of FinTech partnerships. So connecting startups in the industry that were leveraging innovative technology and bringing them into the bank and seeing could, could we calibrate somehow? Could we either use their tech or could we create something together as a product that we'll provide to our, to our clients at HSBC? And in there, I try to bring again this conversation around blockchain into the bank. So I introduced a few different companies to my colleagues internally. And I was just continue to be so much more involved and interested in this space. I think right now we are at a very different stage um, in terms of the blockchain technology. The pilots have really been showing that there is business value. The technology has also evolved. And so I strongly feel like right now is, is the right time to, to move into the next phase, which is implementation. And many in the industry are looking to this. And so this opportunity to write a book um, I arrived last year and I wanted to write about something that could teach other people in the industry and blockchain or web three is really one that I think there's still a small gap around education. You have teams that really understand this, this concept and they're really driving. But if you go outside those teams and try and, and talk to the people, it's for them, they still they have basic knowledge about blockchain, but of course they're not really deep into the woods because they have all the other technologies. And especially nowadays with so many different technologies arriving, you had ChatGPT just um, getting everyone's attention and you have a few other technologies coming through. It's really hard for anyone in financial services to keep a breath of all the different technologies. So I wanted to write a book that really it's a prime for anyone within financial services in banking or within fintech to really understand what are the key use cases, what are the players, and how could I use this in my work or in my company? And so that's what the book is trying is trying to explain in very simple terms. I, I jokingly sometimes saying that it's a book I wish it was there when I start learning because it's such a big um space here that where do we even start so i would say like this is a book for for anyone who wants to learn a bit more and it has 
a few different interviews from a few different experts of the industry and some examples to make it much more interesting for the, the reader. Thanks, Rita. And I think what you know, when we first spoke, um, when we first met, I, I found it really interesting that you and I came at um, you know, the, the use of DLT and blockchain in financial services from very similar perspectives, also being from a consulting background, but also looking at the technology less as as you know brand new purveyor of a new asset class and more in terms of how it can quietly revolutionize. Um, quite a few of the sort of boring background processes um, that take out, you know, time and space and resource um, and cost in, in across, you know, the front to back life cycle of many financial instruments. Um, but before we get into that in a bit more detail, I think most of our listeners will be acquainted with the concepts of blockchain and DLT. But what is Web3? How do you define Web3 in your book? So I define Web3 as this ecosystem of companies who are building on blockchain, so the new internet, and who are trying to balance these con- some a few concepts of decentralization, of ownership, and really of innovation. I think um, a few years back, Web3 started with this concept of being the new internet in which users were owning the data and that's still a part of the web tree but i think nowadays it's so much broader than that and web tree is really impacting finance because until now if you think about the the evolution of finance finance has seen digital transformation throughout the years i mean we started with an atm in the 90s and then with the the internet came and you had internet banking and then mobiles came and you had uh, mobile banking. But if we think about the evolution of the internet, banking is still separate from the internet. And with Web3, the main difference is that you are now building financial services, money and value on the new internet, which is the blockchain. And so we're merging uh, more the internet with financial services. And within this ecosystem, you have traditional finance. So you have companies like, for example, JP Morgan, who I talked to in the book, who are trying to leverage blockchain into saying, what is the value added that we could have uh, for some of the finance processes? And then you have new players, some of them which are much more extreme. So your DeFi, so for example, Aave or MakerDAO, which are run through a DAO, through a decentralized uh, autonomous organization, which is an interesting concept, but you need to be aware of what does that mean if you're partnering up with those types of organizations. And then in the middle, you have what I call a CFI, centralized finance, which will be someone like, for example, Circle, who is leveraging some of the concepts of DeFi, but it's much more similar to what you would call a FinTech. They are regulated, they have a board, they have a CEO. And so it's really interesting to understand all these different players and all the innovation that they are trying to, to do within this Web3 ecosystem. That's a really useful breakdown of, I think, the different types of decentralization that exist, because we often talk about decentralization in Web3 or decentralization in blockchain and DLT. But of course, you know, there's decentralization happening at two potential layers. There's the decentralization of the technology and then the decentralization of so the technology and its governance and then the decentralization of the service provision, which is a whole separate question. And what we're talking about in DeFi is that decentralization of service provision, whereas in applications of DLT and blockchain and financial services, we're more talking about the use of decentralized technology in um, in applications to what are centrally provided financial services, I guess. Yeah, exactly. So if we look back in 2014, when many of the big banks started to looking into this, um, the interesting part was that they were trying to look into the technology, but they were not engaging with this DeFi or CFI space as much. And what we have seen throughout the years is that there is a converge between the Three, these three different players in which they're starting to look into the other innovations and they're starting to say, well, could we use the innovation that DeFi is creating or 
could DeFi be collaborating with traditional finance and take advantage of distribution? One great example that I love to share is, for example, the project Mariana. I don't know if you're aware of that, but in that the regulators, they try to use MMAs, which is automated, automated market methods, which were created by DeFi. So really they look into DeFi and say, well, that's a very interesting innovation. Maybe we could use that really in simple terms as a technology um, or innovation into traditional finance. And so they, they try to use MMAs for cross-border payments. And within the pilots, within the project, they really found out that actually it does create um, benefits, cost benefits, and it, it creates faster payments. And so it's interesting to see as well throughout the years how there is a convergence of these different players and also how the players are changing, especially with regulation. Um, there is some of the, these DeFi players that we see nowadays, we'll probably see them slightly different in a few years' time when there is more and more regulation in which they will have to, to start thinking a bit more like the traditional finance players or they need to start thinking around what do they need to have from a governance, from a technology perspective to be aligned with the new revolution that will be coming at some point. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to come back a little bit later on to you know what the future of finance might look like and what we might what else we might be able to bring in from the DeFi world. Um, but before we get to that, um, perhaps you can take a step back and look at um, you know the 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 impact on traditional financial services and i think you you made a very important point which was around um web3 and the paradigm of ownership that's enabled by blockchain and dlt because of course you know in in the the, the existing internet um we you know there, there is no unique ownership of a digital asset on the internet at the moment. If I put a file on the internet or if I give you, you know, an image or something, you someone else can copy that or you can make copies of it. Whereas what DLT and blockchain technology give us the ability to do is first of all have unique digital assets and secondly have full transferability of ownership of those digital assets. So what's what does that capability of you know uniqueness of digital assets and full transferability of ownership what what does it enable for you know traditional financial services i think the one of the great example is really the tokenization side of it which everyone is talking about so within tokenization you you not only own your let's say your real estate um, so you can create a token that represents your real estate, but also includes your the history of the real estate, includes the ownership of the real estate. So you now own all of that digitally, but also I think that the key interesting part is what can you do afterwards? So if you fractionalize, for example, that, that um, real estate, now you can either rent or sell, let's say, part of that real estate. So as a user or as a client, now you're really owning everything that you have online, uh, but also you can use that for the financial needs. One of the, the great examples I was called, I was talking about is really around founders. I mean, founders nowadays, if if they need some, some liquidity, if they need some money, they either can go to the VCs or angels, or they can go and get a loan with the banks. But the reality is that they have all this ownership of these other assets that they cannot use nowadays for financial needs. So if you think about it, most of the founders will have an office. Most of the founders will have IP and, um, and other sets of, of things that they could be using it um, as collateral for a loan. And so we have seen even in, in the DeFi world where you can tokenize your office or you can tokenize, for example, your IP and use that as a collateral to get a loan in DeFi. So I think it's, for me, it's really the ownership. You have ownership of it, but it's really around what else can you now do with that ownership um, and how can you use it across your different financial needs. What are some of your favorite examples of applications of blockchain and Web3 in um, the financial services and banking sector? I think. 
you mentioned um, digital identity and its potential for um, revolutionizing the way that we exchange information and do things like AML and KYC. Yes, um, so identity is actually a really great example. Uh, for the book I spoke with the team at uh, JP Morgan's around Project Guardian and how they use digital identity um, for, for the Project Guardian pilots. And it's, I think it's really interesting because we all, I mean, we all travel everywhere, but you still have your physical passport, you still have your physical ID cards. And really, I think identity, um, digital identity will enable so much of uh, financial needs. And with new technologies, like for example, zero knowledge proofs, you no longer have to share all your all of your information. So for example, if you go into, into the supermarkets and you're buying some alcoholic drink, nowadays you have to show your passport, which has your name, which has your date of birth, and you're sharing much more information that you would need. And in the future, to make that simple payment, you will no longer have to share all the information with technologies like zero knowledge proof. It can just ask a question, let's say, is this person above 18? And it will receive an answer like yes or no. So it doesn't even get the, the year that you were born. It doesn't even get the month that you were born. It doesn't get your, um, your name or your address or anything else. So I think that's really interesting. And that will enable not only your day-to-day -day financial needs, but it will also enable the the digital um, the digital transformation that is happening in financial services. Because like you're saying, I mean banks and 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 financial services, they spend so much money really just doing all these different QIC and ML um, checks. But also they have a really, they have a big cost as well around reputational risk because they need to hold all this information from their clients for, for a few years. And nowadays, if there is some cybersecurity risk, they have not only the, the cost of trying to solve for that, but also they have some reputational risk of having all their client data available on the internet, for example. So I think we'll provide not only more efficiency, but also safety from the client side, but also from uh, the banking side. And of course, this will enable as well a new layer on, if we think about the DeFi world or even the internet world, where you can have not only your your information within the, the physical world, so your, your car, your, your driving license information, but also you can have um, details, like for example, do you have a DeFi loan? For um, teenagers that nowadays play in Fortnite, they can have all the information around their avatars, their skins, that then they can use that for, let's say, for example, as a loan again, for buying their first house. So it starts enabling this bridge between your physical world and your digital world. And I think that's really interesting as well, this bridging of the, the physical world and, and the digital world. Um, I mean, there, there's been a lot of speculation around, you know, having been basically killed by Meta, what is the future of the Metaverse now? And I think it was always sort of, you know, unrealistic, this expectation that the Metaverse is going to be a completely separate reality in which you know, we we inhabit part of the time and then come back to like the the real world. Um, but more likely that, you know, we will be transitioning are we as we are now to a more augmented reality, for example, where bits of, you know, as a the metaverse are overlaid on uh, the real world, or as you say, where there are bridges, real bridges between the two, um, which is a super interesting conversation in and of itself. Um, but obviously, we are the Digital Pound Foundation, and we are, you know, interested in how digital money can, digital native money in particular, can enable all of these future scenarios and applications that you foresee. Um, so let's talk about that a little bit. Um, how, what do you see as the role that digital money plays in enabling Web3? Yeah, so... 
it really depends where you're based as well. I think sometimes, especially if we're based in UK or US or even Europe, we have almost this vision of our financial system, which is already super developed. And we, we ask that question, like, do we even need a digital bond? Do we even need a CBDC? Do we even need stable coins? So the, the role of the money will really depend on where the individuals are based and it will depend on the economic and political view of the country. So in the book, I talk about Argentina, for example. I don't know if you have been to Argentina before. It's it's a beautiful country, you should definitely go. I, I have been many years ago and I remember going into Argentina and, you know, it, it's interesting because I live in London and I pay everything with my phone. I don't think I even bring my card anymore with me. And going to Argentina, I had to think about actually getting some money to go into Argentina. And with the problem that they have around inflation, it's not just small stacks of money. You need to have big stacks of cash in hand. And for me, like from a safety perspective, you think, well, this is so much cash. I mean, I'm going to be robbed. But the reality is that you need to have a lot of cash money for little value but just the look of it is super impressive and then it's also interesting to remember the days where you're paying for something with cash and you need to be making some calculations around how much money do I need to get back and so on and the other one that we found ourselves was that we needed more more cash we we run out of cash while we were there and so we had two options we would either go to an ATM and take some money out and you can pay quite a lot um, piece just because you are taking money out of, of ATM, or you can go into these, what they call cuevas, which are almost like a, a room into a house, which is hidden. You have to go through a side door and you have this person on the back, they have stacks of money um, and you have to go in there and trust that it's a safe place for you to go and do it. And this is just the normal life or people that live in Argentina because of all the inflation uh, problems. So, I mean, I think there was one point where the the price of the milk in the supermarket will change twice in a day. So imagine like here you go to supermarkets and milk costs one pound, it costs one pound. In there you go to supermarkets, milk can cost one pound in the morning and then it could cost five pounds in the afternoon. And so for them really, something like a stable coin, a digital um, representation of a dollar really, which is back to a dollar, it's really helpful for them to even just use as a saving method. Because right now, because of the inflation, that local currency, it doesn't really allow them to save anything. I mean, many of them work two to three jobs and still they are not able to save because their currency um, changes so much throughout even the day and so they are using it a lot just for saving as a way of saving um, saving their money so it does really depend where you are I think if we come into the Europe and the UK the the digital pound will be used for slightly different things so it could be used really for uh, faster payments it could be used for cheaper payments as well Remittances is, is another big one that they do in the Philippines as well, in which people go and leave. One, one member of the family will typically go work at another country and then they send money home to their family. And by using stable coins to send it home, it's also much cheaper and much faster. In Europe, if we think about it, it's not such a big problem, but we still have people that live abroad. I mean, I'm, I'm from Portugal and I live in UK. And every time that I tried to transfer money between the two different countries, which are European countries, it still costs me a lot. So even having something like stablecoin could really help um, Europe as well. Thanks, Rita. And where are you on the stablecoin versus CBDC? debate so i see the value of both to be honest i'm not someone i know like sometimes people are a bit afraid or unsure about cbdc especially retail cbdc 
um, I think, look, like nowadays we have different forms of money already and they, they are used for different means. So I think in the future we will probably see different forms of money that are going to be used for different means. So I see, for example, stable coins to be used heavily for remittances, while um, a retail CBDC could be used for your day-to-day -day payments. And the wholesale CBDC will be mostly used for cross-border payments. So they all could have very distinct um, uses for people. Now, I think we need to make sure that the technology that we are building, especially around the CBDC, that we have the right privacy elements. And I think most of the central banks that I have look into their research, they, they do have that component of making sure that they have a privacy layer, that the information of the individuals are not passed into the central bank. So I, I think there are some key considerations that we need to have when we're building a retail CBDC, but I do see value. I do see value in it, especially as we're moving, like we we're just discussing about, we are moving into this digital world. Um, and so having a digital pound or a digital euro, I think will definitely benefit. And then we start combining the different components, right? So imagine you have a digital identity. In Europe, they already think about digital identity where you can live in one country and have a loan of a bank of another country. So for example, a student that lives abroad would really simplify that. Now imagine that they also have a digital euro. Then you can start adding on top of the different components and having enhanced experiences from an individual. So I personally see the value of all three and I think we'll probably see all three for different use cases. Okay, and we were speaking briefly before the before we started recording, um, and you mentioned that you'd listened to one of our earlier podcasts with Dejio Onidi, who's involved with the African Stablecoin Consortium and looking at the Nigerian National Stablecoin, and he spoke about the Inara, um, Nigeria's CBDC, and. Um, the observation that, you know, the, the basis on which success is measured um, in the West and uptake of CBDC is not necessarily the same basis on which it's measured in Nigeria. And I wondered if you might be able to, you know, repeat a little bit of that conversation and your thoughts on that, um, because I think it's really important when we think about, you know, why we're introducing CBDCs, for example, um, not to get too caught up in just... Um, thinking about how much faster they can make already efficient payments in some jurisdictions, but also about what they might enable for the future. Yeah, exactly. So I was listening to, to your conversation with him and I found it really interesting because often when, when I go to conferences and I'm speaking with, with other people, especially if you, if you live in the UK or if you live in the US again, I think you have this question mark around okay, but do we even need um, this digital pound? Do we even need a digital dollar? Um, but it, it really depends on where you base. And I think one of his points was saying, really, if you look at the volume of the payments being done with CBDC, it wasn't big. But what was really big was the innovation that was creating. And I think that's really maybe the point that we need to start thinking about what are the benefits that we're trying to look at and there will be different benefits. Um, so for example, in, in Europe, maybe the benefit is not actually to make payments, but it's really, for example, to have this capability of programmable money in which, for example, you can pay earlier uh, a business, for example. So I think we need to start looking into what are the benefits and in different countries, we're gonna have different benefits. And there are even innovations that we haven't thought about before, they are coming true. And I always like to share this example of how in, in Africa, again, they started using mobile data as a currency because they start, M-Pesa, one of the fintechs, they start saying their clients actually buying prepaid data, mobile data, and sharing it with their family members. And those family members would either save it or they would then spend it for, they would swap it for something else. And nowadays that created a whole innovation of 
um, even mobile data as a currency, and you can use that, for example, for microloans. So these are the types of innovations that, I mean, I don't think anyone could have foreseen that in Africa they're going to start using mobile data as a currency that are going to be able to enable in the future. And so I think we need to start being looking at the different innovations that are coming through and use those as really the KPI for success instead of just using the simple volume of payments mm -hmm. as a success metric. I um, totally agree with you. Uh, and I said we'd come back to applications of DeFi in TradFi and the convergence of the two potentially. So perhaps we could finish off with you know, a look into the future from you. Where do you see, you, know, you mentioned um, automated market makers and their potential applications. Where do you see other interesting concepts emerging from the world of decentralized finance? Um, and and what do you, where do you see the, the biggest promise and where it might be applied um, more in more mainstream financial services or where it could become mainstream itself? Yeah, I think that the lending part of DeFi for me, it's super interesting, maybe because I'm, I come from, I used to work at a bank, um, but some of the, really the, the DeFi space in there, I think it's it's very interesting. And I, I would say like, even to finish that, you know, often when we think about the future, we think about these big transformations. And the reality is that the, the future, it's typically less, different than we thought. So there is this this book that it's a few years old book in which they they try and and give examples to people and see what they would think. So a few years back if I have told you for example that you're gonna have a robot that is gonna clean your house, that it's gonna be able to, to tell you the weather, that it's gonna be able to, to um, make online shopping for you. You'll probably think about a big robot with some arms, uh, with a big face cleaning around your house. But the reality is that nowadays we have those and they are small, rounded, circular, black things. So what we think of the transformation of technology versus the reality is often smaller or much simpler than we would think. And I think here around the future of finance is going to be similar. And one example I love to give around this is the, the pilot that I have done in Brazil around smart lockers. And in Brazil with smart lockers, they're trying to first reduce fraud, but then second, enable people that live in more remote areas to be able to receive goods. Um, it's similar to our numbers on locker really that we have in UK nowadays. And so, what they have done was that consumers will go into a specific site, they would buy their products, they would use the CBDC, so Brazil CBDC, to buy the products, and then they will choose a locker that was close to them for the good to be delivered. A few days later, once the good was delivered in the locker, they would receive a text message with the code to open the locker. So as soon as they open the locker, took out the code, what would happen in the back end was that the, the payment, the CBDC payment was held into an extra account by a smart contract. And so as soon as the consumer opened the locker and took the goods, the smart contract would automatically pay the seller. Now, if the good was not collected from the, the person or if the good was not delivered into the locker, the smart contract would automatically refund the consumer. And this is, I mean, we're talking about blockchain, we're talking about um, a CBDC, and we're also talking about IoT, Internet of Things. And it's, it's not that different if you think about it than what we have already nowadays, where you have a good deliver to an Amazon locker somewhere in UK. And so I think this is how we would see some of these components, even to your question around DeFi, we would see some of the innovation from this area coming through. But the reality is that in the day to day, your experience is going to be much more intense, but it's not going to be these big robots with massive irons going around and cleaning your house. It'll, it'll just be an improved experience. Exactly. 
Well, thanks so much, Rita. It's been really interesting speaking to you today. Um, and again, Rita's book, Web3 and Financial Services, will be out in June. So if you're interested in anything you've heard here, then um, please go and have a look for the book. Um, and um, thanks to all our listeners as well. Thank you.